Hi everyone and welcome to Widowed and Young. I'm Charlene Bala Lucas and I'm an ambassador for Widowed and Young. I have been for the last couple of years. And this is Way's Instagram live series 25 Tuesdays, where we're celebrating 25 years of Way's existence and talking 25 different stories. And today uh, we'll be talking to Rupert Hannibal about widowhood taboos. Over the next few weeks, I'll be talking about things like moving forward with new love, challenging widowhood stereotypes, uh, do men grieve differently from women? That's going to be something that we talk about today. Cultural challenges in an interracial marriage, especially when you've lost your spouse. And just the messiness of grief and what that means exactly. And what's the right or wrong way to grieve, to grieve if there is any such thing like that. So as I said, today we've got Rupert joining us. Um, and let me just invite him. And... Because it's Men's Health Week, we're going to talk very much about men and grieving, and Rupert's going to give us his um, his take on it. Hi, Rupert. How are you? Hi, yeah. Good evening. I'm fine, thank you. You're looking very dapper. Nice to see you. <laughs> it's a clean shirt. <laughs> thank you. Where are you at the moment, Rupert? Uh, I am I'm based in North Wales, North East Wales, okay. near a place called Mould. Um, in my kitchen. In your kitchen. Uh, yeah. my, in my kitchen, yeah. Uh, but I'm not originally from North East Wales, which I might be able to sell. I'm originally from the back country. So. Okay, all right. So we are um, talking to you today. Talking to you today. It's Men's Health Week, and on mm. Sunday it's Father's Day, I believe. So it was really, mm. for us, it was really interesting to, we're talking about widowhood taboos over the next five weeks or so. And we really wanted a perspective from a man who's been through bereavement and the loss of a spouse. But I wanted first to begin with um, talking a little bit about your first wife, Sharon, and mm -hmm. how you met her and how long you were married. Right, uh, um, I met her when I was 18. Um, so just a wee boy, and so kind of grew up together, really. I, I kind of grew up together. I think uh, from from eighteen to certainly mid twenties is the formative years, and uh, yeah, we did that together. So um, we were together for thirty years when she died. Um, she died in twenty fifteen. We were married for twenty eight years. We have four four lads. Um, at the time, we had the countless. I, I think we had three grandchildren at the time. Uh, I, know, I know I had seven grandchildren. Um, so yeah, so we, we met in a in a pub, uh, as you kind of do, Rain Smithy. And yeah, we just hit it off straight away. Um, yeah, it was it was great. And very soon we 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 kind of shacked up together and started having kids and we. Um, I wasn't in very good work at the time, and, and neither was she. We hadn't got a really career set up. Um, and we, we, we watched, um, back in the day, there, used to, there was a, a, a campaign on the TV, Find Us a Family, and we watched that, and thought, actually, it was all about adoption and fostering. And that, that kind of directed us into quite a bit of fostering. And we ended up fostering for, for over 20 years, and uh, we had quite a few children in that time. That's amazing, <laughs> quite a few experiences. That's amazing. Wow. Um, Rupert, you're a little bit unclear, so, and every time you move, it's a little bit staticky, so you might want to stay a bit still. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, that's amazing that you did fostering. And you had four boys with Sharon. So how old were they when hmm. Sharon died? Um, that's a good question because I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of a, a typical man, typical dad. And I'm not going to be able to give you the, the exact ages, but they're all adults. They're, they're, um, Two, two were at home, um, but the, the other two had, had got them outside of their own families by then and, and had left town to play the next. Um, so, yeah, I, I, for me, when, when, when Sharon died, it was, I kind of feel for people um, who have got so young children because having young children, it kind of, I, 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 I presume it, it doesn't get the space to grieve. Am I sounding it right now? 
Sorry, Sorry no, it's still a bit static. I'm just trying to see if it's on my side. So we might need okay. to take your earphones out and see if it's better. Okay. Let's okay. try, try that now. Yeah, try it now. Um. Don't worry about it. These things happen. So for those of you joining us, we did have a tech run and it was perfect. <laughs> and now it's just a bit staticky. Okay, okay. Look, keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so, so my children were growing up, so it kind of meant I, did, meant I didn't have to kind of worry about them too much. I gave me the freedom just to kind of be who I was. So, yeah, I've, I've come across lots of people whose grief could, couldn't be, they couldn't address their own grief because they was kind of having to look after the, yeah. their own children. My, my kids were, and they got, their, they got their own partners, and so I, I kind of had that luxury in a way to sit back and just be, be myself. Um, however, I have to say that I was never, I was never open. You know, I, I hid away. I hid, I hid away from my grief, and I hid away from sharing my grief with my kids because I thought that I didn't want to put it onto them. And I don't think, and I know I couldn't have bear to to take their grief on as well. And that's how I felt. So I kind of sat back. And um, I think. I think as as a, I think this is a man thing. I maybe it's a it's just a human thing, but whenever I kind of I remember, and I still do it, still do it now, and even with all the therapy and all the process that I've, that I've done, I think I think about my grief and I jump back. I jump. Mm -hmm. I feel myself jumping away from it inside because it's it's too scary. I don't want to go there. It's too it's too too painful, um, and that's what I did. And it, it built up and built up and built up. Um, I've done a lot of. Because I've, I've now qualified as a, a, a therapeutic counsellor. And to do that, I've had to do a lot of therapy and a lot of self discoveries and personal, personal development. And I did do a project on myself. Um, Sharon called me once uh, in, in the middle of a row. She, she called me um, um, an emotionally stunted bastard. Um, <laughs> And my research I did while well, I was while well, I was studying was to check out whether she was right. Was um, she was she right? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of did the research, and what does that what what does that mean to me as a man? So am I an emotionally stunted bastard, and what does that mean to me as a man? Mm -hmm. And I did lots of research. So I, I have to make a disclaimer here. I'm talking about myself, and I'm talking mm -hmm. about the things that I find. Yeah. Maybe some watching now, listening in, who actually think, well, that's, that's not me. That's not me. And that's that's. That could very well be true, you know. But um, I think the men I've come across uh, and, and shared stuff with come from a similar place. And the reading that I did I've come from this, I I put things away in boxes. Um, there's, a brilliant, there's a brilliant video on YouTube if anybody wants to watch it. It's about men's brains and women's brains. Women's brains uh, are all connected and, they, and, and everything fits in together. And, but men have got boxes and they shut things away in boxes and they get those boxes out and they open them. When, when they when they when want it. when they're ready, the favourite men box is actually the nothing box. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, what we that's our favourite box. So when we when we're just sitting there, like, and you, and you say, "What are you thinking about?" And you say, "Nothing." Well, that means nothing, you know. So it really, really does like, mean nothing. Yeah, it I, really I, that nothing. infuriates me actually because I'm like, "How can you be thinking yeah. of nothing?" And I'm a mindfulness teacher. There are times when you should be thinking about nothing. But Rupert, mm -hmm. you Sharon died from cancer. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. so was there, did you feel that you grieved her even before she passed away? Was there any of that? Because I've heard a lot. No, of I didn't. No, I didn't. I, I went into function mode. You know, I remember, I remember, I can think back clearly to, to the trips to the hospital and, and the, the owners and nursing her and not, not letting anybody else do, do this. I don't want the carers coming in. And, and the carers, actually, the carers didn't come until the day after she died. That was the first time we used to let them in, but it was... Um, so yeah, and I, want, I wanted, I wanted to do it, and yeah. I, and I yeah. wanted to do it pragmatic and pragmatic and practical, and, and do do all those things. Um, so, so, to... so just to go back to this, um, going back to your grief and close, because I know you're now a way member, but it took you a while to become a way member because of. Do you no, know? actually, it didn't take didn't take long. It didn't take long. I was, I was. Sharon died in the in the November, and I joined way in the January. Okay. Um, were you reluctant or were you think, ready to join? Um, 
I needed something. I knew I needed something because I think I've always known I'd shut things away in boxes and my grief was in a tight box and it was and I'd jump away from that from that box. Um and and, and I, I, I really think it's fair to say that that is generally what men do. There's, they say there's two there's, there's, there's two sides of, of grief, really, of the grieving process. Um, it's called the dual process. And one is coming to terms with the loss and, and accepting the loss and, and processing the, the misery and the sadness that goes with the loss. Um, men, I, I think on the whole, it's fair to say men aren't very good with that one. Mm-hmm. Men like the other side, which is... Um, adapting to life without that person in the world. And I was picking up all these things. I thought, yeah, that, that's the safe place for me. I'm, I'm going to do that. Uh, there, there used to be um, a, a video going around the, 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 the way website, you know, the, the Facebook page. And it's, it's regarding the theory of uh, something called Tonkin, like Lois Tonkin. And she talks about how we used to think grief was a small, was, 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 was filled our lives, filled, filled our lives. And over the year time, it's shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. But, but now we look at, look at it like grief stays the way it is and our, we build our life around it. And I thought, that's for me. That's for me. So I, ju- I know that I jumped, and I'm still doing it now, I jumped, that's the, the, the or I just ignored the, the grief, the natural grieving and the come to terms with, Shadow not being here and, and thinking about the cancer and thinking about the death and thinking about all the the, the horrible side of the illness um, and looked at how I could move forward. Uh-huh. It caught up with me. It caught up with me. Um, I was in quite a demanding job. Um, I was past. I've done pastoral care in, 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 in secondary school for, for quite some years. And the, the whole man thing, you know, right, go to work, get my mind off it, get back to normality. And it, did, it, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. And it piled up and piled up. And there were times, um, one time in particular, um, that I had enough. And it was the carpet man. I forgot my phone. I was supposed to meet with the carpet man to fit this carpet. He was late. I forgot my phone. And it was just another disaster. Huge, but this was huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all the things I've gone through, mm-hmm. um, and I've gone through other things apart from Sharon's loss, which, which you might touch on later, I guess. Um, but that was crushing me, that was crushing me, and I was ready to end it there. And that was the you know, I come pretty close to, but well, I had lots of suicidal ideation there. And uh, what, pulled you, me. what pulled you back from that, from that kind of yeah, idea? What stopped me? I think. I, th- I think my kids, hmm. I think me, me boys, you know, I was so proud of my boys and, um, and they love me and, um, and I love them and um, I miss them up here, you know, I, I, I kind of, I have moved forward with my life and that's meant moving away, but I, I miss them and I miss the grandkids. Um, it's the best thing in the world to have a grandchild say that they love you and um, I'd like to have that more often, but it's, um, but it's a, it's a choice between staying stuck where you are and having to move forward. And I do want to talk about you moving forward because sometimes that is seen as quite a judgy, we're, we're judged sometimes when we move forward. And it is quite, a, yeah. we're, we, we sometimes judge ourselves. We're probably our harshest yeah. critics. But before we get to that, when you um, joined Way, did you find you were right. able to talk to other men and women about emotions did you begin to start facing your emotions i was i was guarded i was guarded and i think you know the men the the, the way events are very the men are very sparse you know so it's Mm. it's not yeah so just for for uh, everyone's information um 20 percent of ways members are male 80 percent women but generally women are widowed younger than men and that's kind of statistic uh, but also men, I think, probably a little bit more hesitant to join a peer-to-peer sport group. But when you joined, <laughs> you did you join, was it a walking weekend? And, and that was pivotal for you? No, I went to a couple of meetings, a couple of meals first, which, which was nice. It was, and I, have, I did make connections there, and I still have those connections now, you know, because, I mean, Facebook's a fantastic thing for that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, but, but actually, when I went on the walking weekend, which was... T- t- uh, 2016 
Um, it was one of the scariest things I'd ever done, I have to say, to, to go up to the late districts with, with a whole bunch of strangers. And but I was I was thinking about turning back before I got there, and I didn't. I went, I went ahead with it because I thought I thought I'd got to find something. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd this is the second stage of the, the second of my taboos is I'd got to make myself do something that I haven't done anything. I've got to be brave. I was never brave before. I was quite happy just sitting, watching TV, getting fat and, <laughs> and doing all the, the you know, not, normal kind, kind of things really. Um, I knew I'd got to turn my life around. I'd got to be something different and I'd got to be something better and better able to deal with what I was faced with, faced with. So I pushed myself. When I got there, I was late than everybody else, and there was 50 odd people, mainly women. I think, I think there was only four fellas there that weekend, um, and 50 odd women. And the noise coming from the, the restaurant of laughing women was just kind of, I thought, I can't be widows in there. I can't be a bunch of widows, but it, but it was. And they were having a fabulous time. And I met lots of people there. I think I get in better with women than I do with fellas anyway. But um, I met lots of people there that gave me hope, gave me hope about growing my life around, building a life around my grief. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of spurred me on to do other positive things then. Um, so yeah. um, we'll come back to that weekend because I know it was also pivotal in that you met somebody special. But um, you talk about two things that have come up so far are one in your emotions men grieve differently and, and maybe that's a cultural thing we, we say to young boys uh, if when they fall down stand up don't cry you'll be fine uh, be a strong yeah. boy be be a big boy kind of thing do you feel I, that that was just, you and that's what happens to men generally we, we don't allow them to grieve even when or, or to show emotion even when they're boys do you feel that's true yeah, absolutely and i think the the the, the worst example of that is um, lads when they lose the dad, oh. and you get rather than uh, again this is I'm, I'm, it's a sweep it's a sweeping statement. No, no, no. It's from your perspective, and, and that's fine. So you don't have to. Quite, yeah. Quite. I have done a lot of research. I've done a lot of reading, and I, and I work in bereavement now. So, um, and I've worked with bereaved people. I've met. I've been on um, the Strongman Weekend, which is a weekend for, mm -hmm. for bereaved men. I've had deep, meaningful conversations there, so I'm not kind of just making things up. Sure. Um, I can never, I can never dense it. I think that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, the word that comes over and over and over again is a bereaved boys who have lost their dad, and the dad's mates instead of taking the lads under the wing and spending time with them and maybe taking them for the first time when they're 18 and doing all those kind of things that they haven't can't that that's not there to do to do in there. They turn around to these 13, 14 year old lads and say, right, you need to be a man of the house now. Yeah. Yeah. And it is absolutely the worst thing that can happen mm -hmm. because we are we, we should be encouraging men and boys to be honest, process the grief and carry on as a normal 14, 14 year old or, or where, where, however old they are. Um, could it stay with them then? And, and that's, where, that's where I was. I grew up in a, in a working class environment. Um, I grew up where you, you, weren't, you weren't a wimp. You, if you did anything, if you did anything uh, wussy, you'd have the, 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 the mickey taken out of you. So, so yeah, I, could, I, I was not happy to sh share my feelings. I, I, sh I shoved them all away in, in boxes. And to cry, I tell you when I, cr I cried when I was in my bedroom. I never even cried in front of me, my kids. I, I, and I remember one night going to bed and doing the wail. And I, they probably heard me. They probably heard me, but they didn't say anything about it. And then I remember once going for a walk in South Wales and getting to the top of the hill and just roaring out and just absolutely breaking down. And I, it was a build-up. It was a build-up because I shut those boxes, boxes shut. And it was like that point, the point of the, the carpet, man, it was when those boxes couldn't mm -hmm. couldn't take any anymore. Um, so yeah. it's, in, I did part it's interesting. Oh, so you're, you're talking very much about not being able to grieve openly because you've just said... You went into the bedroom and wailed. You knew that the, your voice had heard, but you didn't even 
choose to talk to them about it. And it's almost like men struggle to have those conversations. But from what we've had a conversation off air, you have talked about turning to self-compassion and self-love and self-awareness. Yeah, yeah. Has yeah. that been a journey for you? And, and is that different for a man, do you think, from a woman, given the work you do now in bereavement? It, 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 it has, and because I've always worked with people and their emotions, so I, I, I passed my first counselling qualification back in 1999, and so I've always had that ethos in my work and with my boys, and I tell my boys to cry. I say, it's okay. <laughs> I all the lads that I've worked with, I've always said, show your emotions, let people know, and it, it's okay to cry. Yeah, I don't practice what I preach, never practice what I preach at all, and I thought, perhaps I need to start do, doing this, and and... I understand it's self-compassion. It's about admitting I've got these feelings and allowing myself to feel them. The thing is, if I allow myself to feel the sadness, it allows me to feel the joy as well. Um, it's a two, it's, it doesn't happen on its own, does it? And you say you kind of um, um, tutoring mindfulness. That's what I think it is about. It's, 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 it's all about mindfulness. I did um, at, the, at, the, at the hospice where, where I do some voluntary work. We had a, an open day the other day, and we and I sat at this mindfulness table, and we there was a load of cards there. I thought I maybe loads of cards there, and it was just trigger points and say, talk about your lost one. What was the favourite television program? What was the favourite piece of music? And what, I thought I need to do that. I need to instead of jumping away, I need to I need to do that like, to keep hold of Shannon in, in, in this world. So yeah, it has been a it's been a tough it's been tough. Um, and what I do find is, is once I start being honest and open with myself and then with other people, they are with me. So I went on this strong men weekend with all bereaved, bereaved fellas. It was a very macho, Jeremy Clarkson type of bravado thing going on. And I was reluctant to go and join it, a bit like that trip up to the Lake District for my first wave walk. And... Uh, it was mind blown actually because I went there and some of the, the hardest looking fellas actually saw a beautiful soft side to them, and I think we do, we we all have them. We all have that. It is just bravado. It's a shield and it's a defence thing that we think that we need to have. But actually, the best defence we can have is to is to be honest with ourselves and self compassion. Okay. Yeah. So what what is Strong Men? Tell me a little bit about it. It's a it's a charity, is it? Yeah, it's a charity. I suppose it's a similar thing to Way. It's um, it's a peer support charity. It's uh, two fellas, Ephraim and um, oh gosh, Dan. They they set it up. They're both bereaved um, parents, and they thought that we need something for for men, bereaved men um, and to allow them to to express themselves. <laughs> I think I, I think it's there. I think it's I think it's okay to say there was somebody there who strolled in his relationships and had to go asking for help because of a bereavement 30 years ago, because he ran away from it 30 years ago. And it's, it's effect, it was affecting his life. Now he, he, he went into therapy and recognised that that's what was going on. And if we don't do it, that it, it can be, it can, it can, it's toxic masculinity is the phrase, isn't it? And, yeah, um, I it's think true. It is, it's probably it is. As it's worth what I, what I saw, or what I heard. Okay. There's, um, there's a funny beeping sound that started. I'm not sure if that's at your end, but we'll keep going. No. Um, I want to go back to the walking weekend because you met uh, Gaynor. Mm. Tell me about that. I did. Yeah, she was um, crazy, really. She's one of the first person, I made my way to the bar, we keep staying away from this restaurant full of loud, loud women. Um, and then she came in there, she was the first one that came in, and um, someone called called Pat, Pat then introduced us. You know, she saw me standing on my own, uh, scared stiff. <laughs> and she, and I have to say, my confidence was been, has been shot, you know, and I that's a bit of a side effect of the grief and not addressing the grief. Um, and... And yeah, and we just hit it up and we was mates. And we walked, that weekend we did uh, The Old Man of Coniston and um, it was fabulous, you know, it was fabulous to meet, meet people and we just made a connection. We made, we were friends from there and we, we met up a few times 
Shrewsbury and uh, Chester read that a couple of days out. And we were just, I, I, had, I had a couple of other widow mates as well. Um, and and that, that was great, actually. So it wasn't so much the meetups for meals and stuff, but it was not just, uh, you know, I think every week I could have got met up with somebody and had, had some time out to myself with, with, with you know, a meal or a gig or whatever. Um, so, yeah, and they just kind of, kind of grew and grew and grew. And it was scary. And I think, you know, the scariest thing that we, we spoke about, that we made us reluctant to get, take any further, was we knew that one of us would go through with Edward again. And that's a, that's a horrible thought. And, and it really she, did had, she had been widowed as well, and you had been, so you knew what that meant, losing one person. Yeah, yeah, because it's, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously in this different place now. I still carry the grief, you know, I still, I still have that, I, mean, I still grow my life around my grief and it's still there. Some days it's bigger than others and some days it takes, whoa, it takes over the whole sense of my being. Um, but the thought of having that, having to go through that again, that was, that was scary, um, extremely scary. And... Gaina was very intuitive about this, and she she, she recognised that she, she was a couple of years further on than myself, and she she was always concerned whether I was in the right place to take the lecture. She was very, very, very um, but um, it's, I did need to lose. Sorry, just talk, going back to you and Gaina, and she was a couple of years ahead. It seems that men sometimes move forward. Faster than, than women. Have you come yeah. across that in your work? And do you think that's true for yourself? Do you think you moved faster yeah. than, than Gaina? And, yeah. and is there a guilt around that? Um, there is a guilt. There is a guilt around it. But, but there's a kind of a, a, a feeling that that's what we need to do to survive. And again, I'm, I'm, I know you speak the statement, so I apologise if, if it doesn't care for it. But the people I've worked with, you know, it's something that comes up with the fellows. You know, it's part of the work is moving forward and, and meeting somebody else. That kind of comes up quite a lot. With with the women, I have to say, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in finding anybody else. It's, it's, it's him that I miss. That's what I mean. They're on that side of the process and the men are doing the process on the other side. So there needs to be yeah, a healthy balance of doing, doing both. So, so you talked about uh, wanting to be more adventurous and more spontaneous and do stuff. Yeah, yeah. Are you? Do you find guilt in that because you weren't like that when Sharon was alive? But it almost took a tragedy to become like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I sense other people have an opinion about that, and it takes some it, to ignore that and all. Because sometimes I will take that on, you know, mate, and they say, oh, they think I shouldn't be doing this. Obviously, they frown on me for going skiing, which I've never done before. I'm, I'm, I'm fit now, which I never used to be before. Or I, I, I do gym. I've retrained. I've, I've got a new career. and it's, but it's stuff that I had to do. I had to do these things to survive. Um, and that in itself was hard because it meant losing stuff. It meant losing my home. It meant losing... Losing the job that I did, losing my status, and, and I, I love my job. I, I used to love what I did, and I love the kids, and I love the, the people that I work with. Um, I made some really, really super friends there. <laughs> and one of those friends was was used to tell me, "What are you missing about that animal? Just go, just go." And she 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 she, she helped me. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lingering thing of where is this the right thing? Because I do, I am, I do so much. Stuff. I live in a beautiful place. Um, I go running around, work the Welsh hills. I do, I do loads of stuff, um, and I, I enjoy life. And is there guilt around that that you've moved forward? It's a, it's a plan. So yeah, th th there is a guilt, but there's a, there's a, there's an understanding that it's a necessity as well. Okay. Uh, okay. And I keep hold of it. I, I keep hold of it. Uh, and my kids, my kids get it. My kids get it, and that's that's what matters. My boys get it. Um, they they love the fact that I'm moving forward. Mm -hmm. they, they love that. Yeah. Um, so it's important. 
One of the things you did that was part of your adventure was to um, start to uh, do a cycling, uh, to, to go cycling, and you and Gaynor went cycling together. You had an unbelievably, um, you were doing cycling time to raise funds when you had a bit of a tragedy. Yeah. Right, actually, that's what we were doing. We sponsored cycle for, for, for What happened? To cycle from Cardiff to, to Conway. Mm -hmm. um, and, and prior to that, Gainers, Gainers, sorry, that's my, can you hear that? Yes. Sorry. Um, Gainers got me, proactive, which is part of my kind of regeneration, if you like, was Gainers a big part of that. And um, We ran a half marathon together, I'd never dreamt I'd do anything like that, but we, we ran a half marathon together and we, 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 and we, a friend of ours mentioned doing this cycle, so yeah, we're going to train. We've got some fantastic bikes, and we're going to train. And Gaynor's dad was uh, was ill in, in hospital in, in Wolverhampton, so it wasn't far from where I lived. Gaynor's from up this way. This is why I moved in to, to move up here to Gaynor. Um, we didn't know the time, but he was uh, he was lung cancer he got, and uh, he wasn't very well at all. He, um, he didn't recover. So we, we after work. One night after school, I'd, I'd met up again at the hospital in Wolverhampton. We did a 30, 38 mile, I think it was, circuit. And as we got back to the hospital, to back where the cars were parked, we, was, we, we was, it tended to go and have something to eat before we went our separate ways. Um, but there's a high speed car on this on the road. We're just cycling almost back at the cars. It's high speed car, it's high speed car. I see it and I think, oh, it's, that's, that's going to slow down by the time it gets there towards, but it didn't. And it's, it's, it's it was some some fellow he was having an argument with his girlfriend on a on his mobile phone, FaceTime thing. He looks up, sees he's heading for the back of the bus, panics moves swerves the car and then it come it it goes into us. I was in I was in front and I thought he was I thought I was a goner and my th thoughts were I'm I'm joining Sharon here. This is this is it. But it's just it's, it's, the, what we think of in a split second is, is, is just fantastic. But I thought, I might, I might not die, but I want to make sure I don't get terribly injured. So I stood up on the, my pedals, and it's a bit like the theory of kids falling down the stairs, <laughs> and they're all floppy, showing you just as adults do. And I just let it, just went with it, and it flipped me over. I'm going through the air, and I look up, and I think, oh, God, I'm still, I'm still alive. And in fact, I thought, it's, it was more explicit than that, the language. <laughs> and then yeah. and then I flipped over. And then I wake I kind of I, I did I did it did pop me out for a short short few moments. And I woke up, I thought, shit, I'm, I'm, I'm still alive, I can't believe this. I thought, I better let Gain let, let Gain know that I'm okay. So I looked around for her, I saw this card that had turned over, and then I saw Gamer lying there and she wasn't moving. And I th quite selfishly, I thought, I can't, I can't effing do this again. Oh no, I can't, I can't effing do this again. And then I looked at this fellow who jumped out of the car and ran. I looked back again and, and I heard her make a noise. I thought, it was such a relief that was. Um, was, that a trigger, was that a trigger in any way? Remembering that you'd lost Sharon? And now here was Dana, and, and she had pretty bad injuries, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, it's extremely bad injuries, yeah. I, and I, I maybe, it's, maybe it's quite selfish of me, but I thought about my pain. I thought, I can't bear that pain again. And and I know that the people have been widowed twice, and I just think... I don't know, yeah. yeah. No, knowing, knowing what that pain is, that... Yeah. that it really is that, that level of grief, and to go through it again, I thought, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I can feel, and, and I think a lot of people watching this who have yeah. lost somebody would understand um, yeah, yeah. because I'm with a partner now, and I think I don't want him to go first. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. wish it on him, but I'm not sure I could go. I can. I just need to say something as well because uh, regarding regarding Shannon, Shannon had said a few times when we knew that she was, um, it was life limits in her illness. Um, 
He said, don't be on your own, Ruth, don't be on your own. And I'd, 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 I'd sort of stop being silly. She told all the kids as well, and I think she told her parents to, listen, he can't be on his own. <laughs> he won't manage on his own, so let's him find something else. But I think more significantly for me, she said, um, don't be sad. Mm. She said it three times, mm. those three times. The last thing that she said to me before she was um, highly medicated with the morphine and the... the um, the, the, the syringe driver went in because uh, I thought when the syringe driver went in, that was I, I knew that was I knew that was it. And um, I, don't, I don't think I tell people this, but I, I, I'll, I'll say it in the public arena. Is that that was the last thing I said to her? She she opened her eyes, and you know, even with this syringe driver going in, she she opened her eyes, and we we, we had full full eye contact. Um, I've heard of things like this before, you, you know, like the, the, the spirit overtaking all the drugs and she was present, I knew she was present and, and I told her that, um, I said, we, we, won't, we will be sad for a short while but we won't be sad for, forever and we'll all, we'll all, we will all be okay and so it's okay for you to go um, and, she, and, she, and she went. Um, yeah, it's quite amazing. <laughs> Are you okay? You yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Um, let's go, let's, that, and, and that's really and, helpful. Yeah, sorry, sorry, but that's what's allowed me to do what I do now. Yeah. Um, definitely, that, that unconditional love that she had for me, and that the priority was for me to be okay. Mm. So, yeah, that, when, when I get the guilt, it doesn't last long because I say, I have to do it. I have to do it for, for, for her. If I don't make the most of my life, that kind of makes the fact that she's lost her life, it loses that, you know, it means it doesn't mean anything, really. That's so true. Um, That's so true. Um, let's go back to Gaina. So, you, you kind of go, okay. you realize that you can't go through this pain again. She survives. Yeah. The... I'll, I'll shuffle over on my bum and uh, get, get over to go over to because um, I'm obviously in a better way than what she what she was. I had um, I, I smashed my one one leg up really, um, my knee, but, but that I was in hospital for for two weeks. Going to his hospital for um, I, I'm sure it was eight weeks or ten weeks, something something like that. How is um, she? Now? Actually, actually, well, check. well <laughs> this this is how I, I think of it as a man. Right, this is me in a in a trauma going into being be a man. Not just by the thinking pragmatically about how I'm going to avoid major injury, but when I see gay now and a, a, a female has gone to a Z shape and there's bones sticking out of her skin, um, I think, okay, she's going to lose her leg, but that's all right, we can deal with that. Her, her, her arm is, is in a similar kind of way, it's dislocated with the bone coming out of the wrist. I think, okay, she might lose her, lose her, lose her arm as well, but that's, that's okay, we can deal with that, we'll find way things around it. And that's that's how I thought, you know. Um, yeah, but, she, but they, 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 they did mend her. It was a, extremely painful. It was extremely horrible for her. Um, she was on the wrong ward to begin with. She was taken to the Queen Elizabeth Trauma Centre. Um, they said that the nurses weren't equipped to, to deal with her for her injuries. But, but yeah. it, it, we got there. And I think her determination really must inspire people you know and i know it does and know it's inspired our friends we have a way family now so just to from that way weekend we have a way family when we got married it was half way members who, who was there, a big big thing big big celebration but still being alive and finding love and, and all that um let's let's and, talk about that so you got married a year after the accident and that yeah, must have been incredibly yeah. emotional two people who've lost their spouses now have found each other you get married mm. What was that day like for both of you and, and for you? Um, <laughs> I think I was still, I was still a bit messed up. Um, I used to enjoy public speaking. I used to enjoy being in school and speaking to parents in, in the parents' evening, you know, with a hall full of parents and and telling them what we do and what I can, what I can do to look after their kids. They always say, what I do about anti-bullying and all this kind of stuff, and I'll, I'll keep the kids safe. And I used to love doing all that. 
Um, but my speech was absolutely dire. <laughs> but pe people don't, you know, people say, oh, it was, it was good, it was all right. But actually, it did nothing like I wanted, wanted to do. Um, and I, th I think I was, I think I was shot, really, you know, I kind of, sh I was all spent out. I think after the, the, the trauma of that really knocked me about it. Since then, I've done my counselling quality and done all my personal developments and my therapy and everything. So I, I feel I feel I'm back to my old self. So I, it was a beautiful day and it was a fantastic day and I wouldn't change it any, any, any way at all. I would just like to have my head in a, in a better place. And that's fair enough to, to recognise that. I noticed you wear a wedding ring. Oh, I wear two. Okay, so one is the explain that and and does, and how does Gaina feel about that? Because that in itself, yeah. taking off your wedding ring. I mean, I still wear the ring Jeremy gave me, but I don't wear our wedding rings anymore. That's Jeremy's ashes there. But I had okay. to because I'm in a new relationship. The whole wedding thing, wedding ring thing, was difficult. How have yeah. you and Gaina negotiated that? We both, we both agree that we're both still widowed. Because we've wondered whether we should be members away still because we're, we're in a relationship now. But we also, I still carry grief. And I still have to work on connecting with my grief, mm. particularly as a man. Mm. I really do. Yeah, uh, yeah, for, for me. For, for, as my, my opinion of being a man, my view and values of being a man, I have to fight that and, and keep connected with myself. That's what the Strong Men Weekend reminded me of, you know, and, and I reconnected with my, with my grief and reconnected with Shannon. Now, I'm aware of this because I'm, I'm still widowed. I may be, I may be married, but I'm still, I'm still, still widowed. This, this, my, my new ring is, is, is special as well because it's um, my dad's, um, my mum and dad's wedding ring, my dad's wedding ring. Um, and my mum gave it to me and she, she was so happy for me when I married Gaina and, uh, she was, I think she was relieved that <laughs> uh, I, was, I was going to be happy. Oh, you were going to be happy. And, and does Gaina have the same thing with the rings? Does she have her wedding rings from you and from her husband? You're going to have to bear with me on this one. She, she, wears, she has a ring like yours that she's got Brian's ashes in. Um, if I remember right, I think she wears her engagement ring. It's okay for us to wear an engagement ring, you know. It's got, it's, it's. I haven't got an issue with it, so that's probably why I can't remember whether she wears it or not. She's confident with it, <laughs> um, but we're okay. We're okay. We, we, I think that's it. We've got photos around the house. In fact, I need to put some photos of, of Sharon up because they're still packed away. Um, but that's not intention. That's that's just we haven't got rent. I'm packing everything yet. Uh, but we've got photos of Brian around, and um, yeah, yeah. This, We've got we've got our memory boxes that we kind of go to. Um, the 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 both very present. We, we, what I did say in my wedding speech, which I made sure I did say, uh, was that um, there's four of us in this in this marriage. It's not just us. Because what when I gave I did some of Shannon's eulogy and I said about it to being half of who I am, and actually that's a load of crap. Because she's every essence of who I am. We grew up together. And even though she is part of every essence of my being, um, and I don't want that to stop, so I'm going to keep that. I should keep that ring on for forever. Because I'm always going to be married to, to both of them. And I love them both. And I love them both dearly. But it's different. There's no better or worse. It's just, it's, it's, it's a different thing. Different thing. Do you think Gaina understands that because she has lost Brian? Would you do you think it would have been different if she if it was she hadn't lost somebody if she was a divorcee or not been a, in a relationship? I think it would be challenging. I think it would be challenging, and I think it would be challenging if we, we were in different places with it as well. I know she's probably two years further on than, than I am when we, when we met, but we we both gave each other that space and. I suppose the two years difference, as time goes on, it's a less of a, less, less of a difference, isn't it, if you understand what I mean? So I'm, I'm, I'm six and a half years on, Gaina is eight years on or something like that. Now. So it's, um, the, the, the difference is, is less. So we're, we're kind of in a similar place with our grief, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
I, I want to, I've just got a couple more questions um, for you, Rupert. You both had children, have children, so you had to blend families. How did that work? Um, well, James lives here, yeah? so I've got a stepson, James. Uh, he's he an adult as well, he's 23. Um, so I, I think I think that's easier when the when the kids are, kids are older because uh, James and I love a bit of banter together and, and so on. Um, my lads call him brother and he calls them brothers and you know and uh, yeah, it, everybody's pretty accepting. But what's, what's, I think what's important, the key to that, is they want to see us happy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know I know my kids love love Gainer. Um of course, they don't love a lot, they love the mum, but they, but they love Gainer for who she, who she is and who we are. So. Okay. And um, the other question I've got is, you moved to Wales, you sold your, what was your home with Sharon. How, does, how did that feel, letting go of that marital home? That, that's, after Sharon died, that's that, that home, which, which had been home for my poor boys and for us um, and... 90 odd foster children over, over the years. So it was, it was a lot of history there, a lot of, lot of history there. Uh, but when Shannon, when Shannon died, um, the soul of the house slowly slipped away as well. And it, it, it didn't feel like my home anymore. So it kind of made it easy to, to move away. Um, I was going to be moving anyway. Uh, it's just in the, in the meantime, I met, I met Gaina, who lived in the beautiful. Clividian Range, early they'd stand in the beauty in North Wales. So it's not very warm up here, but uh, it's very beautiful. It always rains when I'm in Wales, so <laughs> I'm not sure I should come to Wales. Maybe this time I'll come, it'll be sunny. I, I'm very aware of that, so I won't speak too much. But I do want to ask you, um, Rupert, are you happy now? Um, I think, as I said before, I can't not be happy. You know, yesterday I went for a run. And I was thinking, I was thinking about this, this yesterday. I went for a run, and I'm running around in this beautiful place, and I see, uh, I think they're called prettily butterflies, and uh, the early flowering purple orchid. Uh, these, these things you don't see anywhere else. I'm going to Glastonbury next week. I've never done, done never done that before. I'm going to Glastonbury in my camper van. I can't say I'm not happy. I went to make my um, my day home and met my old colleagues, and. Yeah, and it was it was wonderful. I can't say I'm not happy, but I I know that I'm forever going to carry this ball of sadness in my stomach. Um, that's never going to go away. But you see, the happier I make life, the easier it is to to carry. Some days, some days that that ball of sadness is massive and it takes takes over. And I think whereas before we should shoving things away in boxes would make me short-tempered at times or whatever, and get angry with myself and about the most stupid of things. What happens now, it makes me sad. Uh, and I know that I have some sort of depression and um, some, days are, some days are pretty grey and I can't get keep myself out of it. Um, again, I try to lift, lift me up, but um, there's, nothing, there's nothing can be done. The next day, I'm fine. <laughs> um, I, I, the, the other big thing for me is uh, my work. So when I lost my, when I moved away from my work, which was the essence, you know, the big thing of who, who I am, um, I felt I felt useless. And I thought, well, who am I? Who am I? Mm. I? I need to be helping people. I need to be doing doing stuff. And so retraining, I've got this. I don't get paid at the moment, it's all voluntary. But Tuesdays at the hospice, when I'm working with bereaved people and being a part of their learning to deal with their loss is the most fantastic thing. Mm. And the only day I can guarantee that I'm going to be happy is on the outside is Tuesday. And Tuesday is my best day, best day of the week. And Gaina will, Gaina will verify that. She says my, my mood is totally different on a, on a Tuesday. Rupert, um, happy on a Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rupert, have you got any kind of final thoughts bearing in mind that this is mental health week, men's health week? And any kind of thoughts for widowed men, especially? It's, it's self-compassion. It's be true 
take, be brave and take that step and feel, feel the loss, feel the grief. And that way we learn to deal with it. If we, if we shove it away in boxes, we don't learn to deal with it. And it, and it, it takes control of us. Instead of, one of, one of my, my clients talked about um, a room. I talk about boxes. They talked about a room. And they, they didn't want to open that room. They didn't want to open that door. But once we together, we learn to open that door and dip in, then we could shut it again and learn that we, could, we can do that. Yeah. And that is a much easier way to, way to be and do it. And since I started doing it, I've not had suicidal thoughts or, or anything since I've been able to, 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 to take control of my grief uh, and not let it control me. Um, can, can I just, I've got to mention something. Because sure I've got mean. a little... Whenever I try and talk about um, loss and grief and, and, and death, I always share this, this story. Um, I had a very privileged job at uh, Lee Sands High School, and I, and I loved it. We had we had three child bereavements while we were there, and, and each one was horrific in its own way. Um, one was one was an actual a murder. The, the other one was a, a, a lad who um, died from. Um, Sepsis, uh, so suddenly. And the other one was a, a boy called Nahavi, and it's okay for me to share this boy because his, his parents are laying the Um But Nahavi was a year seven boy, and never actually came to attend our school regular. But I was kind of given the role of family liaison, family support with the school. And he was a wonderful, wonderful boy. He was a beautiful soul. And I took his friends round to play with him the one day. He'd stopped. Nahari made the decision to stop his medication because he, his, his treatments because it was it was just far too much of him to bear. He'd be making it too too long. So he had made that decision, um, and I was I was part of the I felt part of the family actually all that in that process. Um, very 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 honoured. And I took to him. The one boy broke down, and Nahari said, "What are you crying for? What are you crying for?" And he said. Because I'm not going to, we knew that this was the last time they were going to be playing together. And he said, I'm not going to, this, we're not going to be able to do this again. We're not going to be able to do this. And he was absolutely distraught. And no, he says, it does not matter, man. It does not matter. He says, Mr. Hannibal has brought you around to play with, to play with me. And we've got this time together now. And that is, that, I have to say, that moment has changed my life in a way, in, in certainly my perspective of, of life, that... We may be dying tomorrow, we may have lost someone yesterday, but we have the here and now. And that is what it's, that's what that's what's important. And we and we need to make the most of, of that time. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Rupert, for sharing that. That's so, so beautiful. It's really touched me. I'm sure it touched others. Sadia says, 16 years later, I think I'm still grieving. And that's that's interesting, isn't it? Grief is so different for so many people. And as you say, it never really goes away. It just changes shape. Um, we've got Claire MC68 says, such an amazing man. Honored to have worked with you, Rupert. So inspirational. You made such an impact on so many young people's lives and the adults you worked with. That's such a lovely comment. Who is that? It's Claire MC? I don't know. Oh, uh, it's yeah. Do you know who that is? Love, love, love you, Claire Mac. Claire <laughs> Mac. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your time, Rupert. I'm so, so glad to have been able to speak to you and for you to share all your experiences and all your, everything you, the knowledge you've gained from working with people as well, but also from your own experiences. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've, it's, been a it's been an absolute pleasure. I've, I've really, it's meant a lot to me doing this and all part of my process as well. <laughs> Good, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, so just to say, I know that it's a bit echoey, but I do want to finish to say thank you to all of you for watching. I'm on next week with Rami about uh, moving forward uh, as a young Asian widow and what that entails. Uh, huge uh, thank you to all the guests, including Rupert, for coming on and sharing your stories and being so vulnerable. I know how difficult it is. And, but it's by hearing these stories that people who have lost spouses and loved ones can move forward um, in whatever way they choose. 
And remember that you can watch all of these shows on our YouTube channel, but also on Instagram. We simply follow them. And Rupert, uh, if anybody wants to follow you, the, um, the your uh, handle will be below this as well. So just to let people know. Um, I'm Charlene Lucas. If you want to join me, I'm at Just Joom, J U S T J H O O M. I'll see you all next week here at 8 o'clock when I speak to Rami. But until then, take care of yourselves. Rupert, thank you so much. Take care.